I was a student at, at Yale and, and wrote a paper about the, the computerized society that was on the horizon. It was pretty clear then uh, with IBM, uh, you know, installing the, the big computers around that the world was going to change. And the paper was about how this was going to change a lot of things and in particular it was going to change the way things had to be distributed and moved to support those automated uh, devices. And then I sort of let that lie. I uh, didn't get a particularly good grade on it, as I recall. It, well, uh, I don't really remember exactly, but at one time in an interview like this, I said, I guess I got my usual gentlemanly C, and so that just sort of stuck, but we'll just leave it at that, I suppose. <laughs> I don't think it was uh, prescient or uh, uh, brilliant in any, any respect. Then when I graduated in 1966 from Yale, um, like a great percentage of my classmates at that time, I went into the service in the Marine Corps of the Vietnam War, had uh, begun in earnest, and spent four and a half years in the Marine Corps, and then sort of crystallized the idea for FedEx on the supply side, on the, the you know, how to solve the problem that had been identified in that paper. In the, uh, the, the, the military, there's a tremendous amount of waste, you know, I mean, the supplies are sort of pushed forward, like you push food onto a table and invariably all of the supplies were in the, the wrong place for where they, where they were needed. So just sort of observing that and uh, trying to think about ways to, to have a different type of a distribution system, uh, that's what crystallized the idea. The solution was, in my mind, to have a, an integrated air and ground system, which had never been done and to operate not on a linear basis where you try to take things from one point to another, but operate in a systemic matter, manner, uh, sort of the way a bank clearinghouse does. You know, they have a bank clearinghouse in the middle of all the banks and everybody sends someone down there and they swap everything around. Well, that had been done in transportation before. Uh, the Indian post office, the French post office, American Airlines had tried a system like that shortly after World War II but the demand side and the supply side had really not, you know, met at an appropriate level of maturation. And by the early 70s, when I had gotten out of the, the service, it was very clear that this new society was, was coming in earnest. And so at that point, I said, what the hell, you know, let's try to put it together. And uh, that's how FedEx came to be. And then from that point forward, the requirements for this type of uh, system were so profound and so big, really for the next 25 years to this date, we've simply been running just to keep up with, with the requirements. And that's what led to the hundreds of planes and the thousands of trucks. I wish it was something I could say was, I was so smart. It was just like Pogo the Possum said, you know, if you want to be a great leader, find a big parade and run in front of it. And that's what we've been doing for the last quarter century. Well, I think uh, first and foremost, the, the idea was a profound idea, as, as has been shown. I mean, here, here now today, 170,000 employees and $16 billion. And as I said, the, the requirement for this type of a system were so great and were in, in increasing at the time, I just had the, the good luck to have an idea that was sort of on the tide of history, if you will. I'm sure many, many other people who have been much more successful would say the same thing. I mean, uh, Bill Gates being given the opportunity to make the operating system for IBM and then the huge explosion of demand for PCs. So an awful lot of success, I wish it were not the case, but it is, an awful lot of success is being in the right place at the, at the right time. So that was a very big part of it. I think secondarily naivete was a big part, uh, just not knowing that I couldn't do this and in retrospect it was uh, ridiculous to try to put this system together uh, was, which required so much upfront money and required changing a lot of government regulations but I didn't know that at the time. and. Uh, I think uh, probably my experience in the service where um, the, the currency of exchange in FedEx was just money 
you know, it wasn't people's arms and legs or, or, or lives. And so my perspective on it were, was perhaps a bit more, um, I don't know how you'd say it, uh, uh, I was willing to take, take a chance because losing wasn't the worst thing in the world that could happen to you. I had seen that very clearly. So those, all of those things sort of played a role there. Luck, uh, naivete, willingness to roll the dice, do something productive, I guess. We're all individual parts of the, of the uh, puzzle. I was very convinced that the idea was the central feature of the, of the new economy, that without a system like this, it simply wasn't going to be, to be able to work. So I was, in every sense of the word, a zealot. I mean, I felt very strongly that this needed to be done, that it was something that would be extremely useful to people, and that it would make uh, the, the economy and the, the, the society and the system work uh, much better than, than it would work uh, absent that. And, and I think it has, because there's so many things that have evolved out of that, that system. You know, Dell Computer, I mean, it relies on the types of systems that we, that, uh, that we pioneered. And almost every type of high-tech and high-value-added business today that is by far the preponderance of economic activity in this country and increasingly around the world is facilitated by systems like FedEx or our, I hate to say it, able competitors. <laughs>
Well, my childhood was uh, autonomous in the main. My father had passed away when I was four, had a very uh, lovely mother, but uh, not having a, you know, a father influence, I guess I sort of learned a lot of things on my, my own. Uh, I think that would be the best characterization of it. Well, uh, through a lot of hard knocks, I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, learning when to stand up and when to sit down and when to shut up and when, when not to. Uh, I had a couple of uncles that were very uh, helpful to me, but uh, I was not around them every day, but in the summers and so forth, they were very good to me in terms of teaching me a few things about life. I had a lot of um, uh, things, I think, that influenced me when I was growing up because, again, not having one single uh, focal point in a, a father, I, I sort of picked things and, and chose them from a lot of different points. Certainly my coaches were very important to me. Uh, my high school football coach was very important to me in uh, sort of setting me straight on a few things. I think I learned uh, from him, uh, he was, uh, he was a, a little guy that was uh, a great football player at Georgia Tech and he just was uh, indefatigable. He just uh, would never ever say, uh, say die, you know, he just absolutely uh, proved to me that persistence was a very big part of, of making it in life, and I, I never forgot that lesson. My uh, middle brother and I used to try to beat the devil out of one another on a regular basis. He was about uh, five or six years older than I was, and then, of course, we, like most siblings, grew up and got to be very cl uh, close. Uh, thank goodness for my big brother, who always mediated between the two of us. Just kid stuff. I don't think that there was any one incident uh, that, that changed my life. It was simply the observation of a lot of people that I admired and I sort of synthesized a lot of things from those, those folks. My coach, my uncles, my teachers in certain areas. I remember I had a marvelous English teacher that sort of opened my eyes to the fact that uh, there'd been a lot of people on this planet before my time that might have a thing or two to say uh, of use. So I, I got a lot of things from a lot of, lot of people. I just sort of picked and choose, I, th I think. I read a lot of history, I, I, and still do, as a matter of fact. Uh, there are little uh, anecdotes of here and there. I remember reading a book that's very famous called Death Be Not Proud that affected me a lot about a young boy who had a brain tumor and how he handled handle that and then I read an awful lot about the famous people, you know, the, the generals and the presidents and things of that nature. I always loved to play sports and that was <clears throat> the biggest uh, avocation I had as a, as a youngster, although I, I suspect that I was unusual in the amount of reading I did. I, I, I loved to read when I was young, I love to read today, I still spend a tremendous amount of time doing that. Well, I remember reading a biography of uh, General Lee, of course, which uh, was obligatory for any kid from the South, and uh, uh, perhaps he was, he was, he was working for a, not a very good uh, cause, but the, the way the man uh, conducted his affairs and, and managed his life were very exemplary, and I think that had a very big effect on me. Well, profoundly in many ways, some good, some bad. Uh, obviously, the war was a very uh, traumatic thing for all of us who participated in it. Uh, clearly one of the great uh, historical mistakes of all time. Uh, Barbara Tuckman wrote a great, great book about the great historical mistakes, you know, George III losing the colonies, the Catholic Church losing the monopoly on Christendom. And, uh, and Johnson's uh, uh, prosecution of the Vietnam War. But for those of us who were in it, it was very um, uh, traumatic, I think, uh, you know, obviously, as any uh, thing like that would be. But there were some good things about it, too. I learned an awful lot in the Marine Corps, particularly about, I think, how to treat people, uh, lead people, um, which has played a big role in FedEx, a big part of the employee relations uh, systems and all that, that we have at our company came from my experience in the, in the service. The, the Marine Corps is the best when it comes to teaching people how to lead other 
other folks. And um, so it had a profound experience on me, some bad, some good. When I was uh, in the Marine Corps as a lieutenant, I had uh, uh, come up from a, a good background, went to a fine university at Yale. I, I wasn't exactly exposed to folks that were in the blue collar uh, professions and, and, and occupations. And then here I was in the Marine Corps and became a platoon leader and I was surrounded by kids like that. I maybe was three years older than they were. I was 21, they were 18. But these were uh, youngsters from very different backgrounds than I was. Uh, you know, blue collar backgrounds, steel workers and truck drivers and gas station folks. And there we were out in the countryside in Vietnam, living together, eating together, and obviously going through all sorts of things. I think I came up with a very, very different perspective than most people that end up in senior management positions about what people who wear blue collars think about things and how they react to things and what you should uh, do to try to to be fair to those those folks. So it, in that regard, it was an invaluable experience and, and a great deal of, of what FedEx has been able to accomplish was built on, on those lessons I learned in the Marine Corps. Well, I had several people that were that profoundly affected me. One was my platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Jack Jackson, who was a very uh, wizened man that was a uh, you know, about 12 or 15 years older than I was, or maybe it was 10, I don't know. And of course, I'm the officer and he's the senior NCO. And uh, uh, of all of the education I ever got, I think he was the one that gave me the, the PhD, so to speak. And then interestingly enough, in Vietnam, I had a, a, a very uh, close friend who was our uh, battalion chaplain. Uh, Father Vince Capadano that had a profound effect on me, uh, who ended up receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor, as a matter of fact. Well, Sergeant Jackson, again, uh, was a man who knew the ways of the world. He knew the way, <laughs> the way uh, uh, people who are uh, kind of nine to five folks and uh, have, have blue collars, not white collars, uh, look at things, and uh, he just gave me a real education on that. So he was uh, uh, a wonderful man and taught me a lot. When uh, I first met Sergeant Jackson, I had, uh, I had grown a, uh, a mustache and had taken up the uh, affectation of smoking cigars because I thought this made me look, you know, quite uh, dashing and uh, much older than my 22 years or what have you. And the first thing that Sergeant Jackson did after I uh, asked him to in essence, take the insignia off, you know, just tell me straight up what I could do to improve my performance. And he told me, he said, well, the first thing, shave off that ridiculous mustache and quit smoking cigars because you look absurd and, and be yourself. And I, I don't think I ever forgot that. I don't think I ever tried an affectation after that point in my life. And he uh, told me that I looked like, a, you know, a smooth shaved kid trying to to uh, be something that I wasn't, and I, that stuck with me a long time to this day. <laughs>
uh, you'll never be able to deliver at the, at the levels of expectations of the customers. I mean, you can't make people do what's right. You can, you can lead them to that in point, and you can empower them to make the right decision, but if you don't produce a culture that allows them to do that, then uh, all the rest is just, uh, uh, as one of my old business partners said, used to say, bumping your gums. And uh, that's Jim Barksdale of Netscape, by the way, who's been very successful himself. Um, so our people service profit philosophy f insists that our people be treated fairly, and if we give good service and we come up with a, a reasonable profit, that we make that uh, a good deal for our employees. Profit sharing, promotions, uh, complaint procedures. I mean, if you, if you spend any time looking at the culture of FedEx, you'll find that PSP philosophy is the foundation on what everything else is, is built. Secondarily, I think, has been our management system, which is built on continuous quality improvement. We decided a long time ago that percentages were not acceptable to our customers. In other words, 99% sounds great unless you're the 1% who we don't deliver for. So we never talk about percentages. We built a management system which measures problems on an absolute basis. And the secret is as traffic or volume increases, the number of complaints have to go down on an absolute basis. In other words, we've got to get better and better year after year. And we spend a huge amount of money, particularly in the technology areas, that allow us to, to incrementally improve every part of the operation year after year, month after month. So that's the second big thing, uh, I think, that was a big uh, part of it. Well, I think the third uh, uh, underlying element of the, of the FedEx formula or, or, or culture after the philosophy and the continuous improvement uh, uh, management system has been the the focus on 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 changing as time uh, changed and markets changed and people's expectations changed. We changed with them. Uh, for example, when uh, it became obvious that people wanted to interface with with FedEx electronically, many years before people were doing this, we built an electronic interface system that allowed them to do business with us. When the internet came on the horizon, we built versions of that that allowed people to interface with FedEx over the, over the internet. And now there are you know, millions of people doing business with FedEx every day electronically. Uh, lots of different examples of that. That's just one thing where we have uh, a culture that allows us to, to change without that being threatening to the people that work at the company. That was sort of putting our money where our mouth is, there's no question about that, but um, the, the fundamental uh, principle behind fast cycle or express transportation is that you are substituting uh, your services for, for other uh, processes. I mean, if an uh, electronic manufacturer is going to truly operate without inventory, or field service engineers are not going to have lots of parts and pieces to fix things, you know, uh, rat hole in their trunk of their car, then when they need the part or piece or they need the, the item delivered to the customer, you've got to perform. And you've got to be able to let them uh, know where this item is all the time. I mean, because they're important items. I mean, it's not like we're carrying sand and gravel. You know, we're carrying chemotherapy drugs and important manuscripts and electronic parts and, and pieces for airplanes that are grounded. So when we pick it up and say we're going to have it there early the next morning, I mean, we have to deliver. There's nothing else to it. So putting the guarantee in place was much more important internally than it was externally because most of our customers, based on the experience they've had with us, they believe we'll deliver. But if when we said to all of the employees, you know, this is guaranteed. If we don't get it there, I mean, we don't get, get paid. Now, <laughs> it's very clear to everybody what they need to do every day. And again, we manage in a mathematical 
manner, the continuous improvement every single day so that each year that goes by, the company service gets better, not worse. And that's very rare, I think, in terms of big service organizations. Most of the time, as they get larger, service deteriorates. It doesn't improve. I don't find it that stressful. I find it fun. I mean, it's a business is a game. It's a, it's it's great fun. I take enormous pride in the fact that we now have 170,000 people employed. You know, that's what it's all about: is uh, giving people good jobs, and uh, we we try to have a lot of fun. You know, the the company, as is evidenced by its its very famous advertising, has always been tongue in cheek. You know, the, uh, the fast-talking man and uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago up to the 1998 Super Bowl where we ran a test pattern on there and just put a little script down the bottom and said you'd have seen a great commercial, but uh, they didn't send it FedEx. I mean, we've always kind of um, done things with a, a little bit of, uh, of humor in them, and I think that's important. Oh, it's everything, my goodness. I can't imagine going through life without being able to, to laugh at things. I mean, even when things get, get bad, there's always, a, there's always a humorous side to it. I think it's maybe the most important attribute somebody can have to get through life, because everybody has tragedy and everybody has <clears throat> things that happen. And if you don't have that uh, reservoir of uh, whatever, goodwill or ability to kind of look at yourself with a little, uh, little bit of uh, humor, I think you're missing an awful lot of life. Well, criticism doesn't uh, uh, bother me. I, I think what we've tried to do inside FedEx is to uh, say that uh, criticism is a real opportunity to improve. You know, in other words, when we do something wrong for a customer, that's when we really have a chance to learn how to do things better. In terms of managing the company, uh, we've, made some, uh, we've made some mistakes uh, from time to time. We've gotten criticized. The mistakes have been relatively small given the overall success of the company. But I've never uh, been bothered too much by, by criticism. I mean, Folks are entitled to do that. It's a free, free country, increasingly a free world, so uh, let them take their best shot. And if they're right, and maybe they may tell you something that you, you didn't know before. I think probably um, uh, conviction. Uh, I was convinced that what uh, I was trying to do with my teammates was important and that it would be, be successful in the opposite side of existence. Uh, very rarely have I ever seen any business uh, or, or major undertaking that goes on a straight line. There have been some. I mean, there's zigs and zags, victories and defeat, and you have to be propelled by that conviction that what you're doing is right and what you're doing is important and, uh, and to persevere in it. That probably uh, more uh, than anything else. I think secondarily, um, uh, I've been uh, very interested in the people who I work with being successful as well. Uh, I don't think we have many people who've worked at FedEx, particularly in the executive ranks, who've left and gone on to do wonderful things that don't have good feelings about the company. And that's, I hope, because they feel they were treated fairly and got their shot at uh, glory and opportunity and I think that's a big part of it to make sure that the people you're working with have a chance to to be successful and then third uh, is that element of humor yeah you've got to enjoy what you're doing and uh, have some fun and uh, be able to laugh at yourself a bit Well, the big challenge for our company in certain ways parallels the big challenges for the country. I mean, our company has become enormously uh, global in nature. I mean, we're the primary means, meaning FedEx and, and our competitors, uh, of moving 
the high value added, high tech goods uh, around the world. And that's what's propelling global growth today. It's not the growth in mining and lumbering and, and agriculture, it's the growth in electronics and computers and uh, new medicines and equipment and things of that nature. And we're the way those things get to, to market. We're the thing that binds everybody else together. And successfully navigating from a, uh, a mostly national economic structure to now a global structure <clears throat> with different types of cultures and governments and what have you. I mean, all you have to do is pick up the newspaper and see it every day. It's going to be important that the United States and FedEx, every year that goes by, does better in the way we deal with other cultures and uh, is respectful of, of other people's points of view and makes a contribution and doesn't become one of the problems in the world. So I think they're very parallel in certain ways. I think the most important uh, piece of advice that I could give them is the uh, tremendous reservoir of knowledge that's out there today. Uh, you know, spend some time learning, learning how the world has evolved. There, there are a lot of good lessons out there and there are a lot of things that come from history and from other people's experiences in the past that will just be, you know, gosh, that's right, you know, I mean, why that, you know, that's exactly uh, the solution to this problem or it's exactly uh, what I ought to do and what have you. And people that don't take advantage of that, particularly today with everything online and available to you on the internet and uh, quick delivery of books or whatever you need, uh, to, to not take advantage of your educational opportunity is a real tragedy. Well, there have been an enormous number of business books. Uh, I have I tried to be a student of, uh, of management and uh, Michael Porter's books uh, on strategy and Levitt's books on marketing and, of course, Ducker, the, the ultimate uh, teacher on management. Um, a lot of books, uh, I think, on um, uh, the way societies have developed uh, in, in the past is one I, I just finished uh, reading, which is very popular as we're uh, doing this, uh, this interview that's uh, uh, by uh, Daniel Jurgen, and it's on the, the, um, uh, the way the market economy has, has overwhelmed governments and national uh, systems uh, everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, there have been some books like that that have just really grabbed my uh, attention over the years. A book by Paul Johnson, who's sort of an irascible fellow in, uh, in uh, England called Modern Times, which is just a great compilation of all of the uh, mass absurdities of the 20th century, really gives you a, a, a picture of uh, a lot of things that have happened over the past 30, uh, to s really longer than that, over the entire century that have um, uh, created the opportunity world we live in, in today. Uh, David Halberstam's uh, written several good, good books that I would recommend to, uh, to people. Um, uh, not only Jurgen's current book, uh, but his previous book, The Prize, about the oil uh, evolution, uh, the evolution of the oil industry over the years, it's probably as good as anything on, on um, how the modern world came to, came to exist. Uh, his new book, by the way, I failed to mention, is called The Commanding Heights, which was a statement by Lenin about the necessity of government controlling the commanding heights of the economies, the big companies, the big uh, economic activities. I think most of the important documents probably precede the 20th, 20th century. Um, I think they uh, <clears throat> made a good uh, stab at um, trying to set a stage for human development in the UN Charter. There's a lot of things in there. It's been corrupted a bit 
you know, by the flow of things, but if you really read it, it, it takes the thoughts of the American Revolution and straight back to the Magna Carta, you know, the importance of the individual, the inherent rights that individuals have, and that battle's still being fought out <clears throat> around the world. So I don't think there are many documents in modern times that are any more important than that for all of the nations of the world to write down a piece of paper and, and, and codify that. And I always followed it, but that document exists, and I think uh, there's a good chance that you know, people can build a, a much better world in the 21st century that they've done in the 20th on that foundation. I think the American dream is uh, uh, freedom. It's the ability to do what you want to do. It's the freedom to succeed. It's the freedom to fail. And uh, freedom to live your lifestyle within reason, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, the way you want to live it. Uh, to me, that's the American dream. A lot of people uh, talk about it. Very few people in the history of the world have ever had that, that enormous opportunity.